Good morning, Asbury. Good morning. Great to see you this morning, although this feels a little weird, doesn't it? It, uh, it, just, it just does, but it's good, and we have so many more people than we've had before because, uh, well, we can uh, space it out, and so uh, I'm so glad that, glad that you're here, and uh, we get a chance to worship together and praise God together, uh, hear from God's Word together. We look forward to um, uh, what He's going to say to us. So let me open up in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for a chance to meet with you and worship you, learn about you and your ways in our lives. Lord, there are so many challenges and uh, so many good things that we come with all of who we are. And we say, Lord, would you please meet us where we're at? And speak into the hard parts of life and lord let us have your joy to revel in the good parts of life lord thank you for the fact that you are very present amen welcome everyone to our service as we prepare ourselves to worship god we are going to take a moment and look at psalm 145 verses 1 to 3 it says, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. A.W. Tozer says, the goodness of God is infinitely more wonderful than we will ever be able to comprehend. So this morning, let's reflect on God's goodness. Goodness that no matter what we are facing, we can fill our lives with joy from him that gives us strength. Let's stand together as we sing the joy of the Lord. <laughs>
reading today is James 4, 1 to 10. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you see that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says, without reason, that the Spirit has caused, uh, has the Spirit He caused to live in us envies intensely? But He gives us more grace. 
That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before God, and he will lift you up. One of those challenging passages. But one of the part of in the middle of that, it says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. That's his promise to each one of us. Where God knows us, and he loves us. I want to pray. Last, last week I led you in a prayer acrostic. P stands for pray. R stands for repentance. Um, A stands for ask for others. And why stands for ask for yourself. I'm going to lead you through that again. And you're just going to pray in the silence of your own heart. And then uh, we'll, uh, I will close it off. Let's pray together. Lord, today we come before you knowing that you're very present. And I thank you that we get a chance to, to talk to you about a lot of really important things. But first of all, Lord, we want to praise you. So in these moments of silence... We would give thanks for something that you've done. Lord, if there is anything that stands between you and us, would you bring it to our minds so that we can silently confess them and that we can draw near to you? Thank you, Lord, for your promise that when we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, there are people that we know who have needs, and so we would take a few moments to ask for them. And Lord, we also want to pray for ourselves. We each have needs. So we bring that to you. Draw us close to you, Lord. Help us to be the kind of people who, who love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and who love our neighbors, ourselves. Lord, we pray for our church and, and we pray that you would have your way in our lives. And Lord, we pray that you would draw uh, to, um, to us the, the people who you want us to minister to. I'm praying that dozens and dozens of people will come to know you each year because of your people here at Asbury. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
You have led me through the fire in darkest times. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness. guidance and making decisions, but decisions aren't getting easier. I pray for my relationships to improve, but they're just getting worse. Would you talk to me? I can't hear you. I can't smell you. I can't touch you. I can't feel you. Would you just please talk to me? What do you want me to do? I'll do it. You want me to read more? You want me to pray more? Is that what you want? Fine. Our Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come. I don't even know what that means. Uh, what? A kingdom of, of justice? Uh, of equality? Of freedom? What? A kingdom of french fries and sour cream? Uh, of cucumbers? Of what? That's all I know is this turning all wrong and wrong. Where is this kingdom? Is this all there is? Right here, right now? Is this all I'll ever know? What do you want from me, God? Would you talk to me? Are you even listening? Seems like you pray and you pray and you seek God, and yet he doesn't seem to answer your prayers. You ask God, and it seems like the heavens are like brass. You look for answers, and it doesn't seem that the answers come. And some of those prayer requests are important. 
I've seen people who their faces broke over unanswered prayer. They prayed for their grandfather or mother or some significant other in their life to be healed. But instead of being healed, they died. The takeaway from that experience for some people that I knew was, well, God can't be good, or God doesn't hear me, or God doesn't answer prayer, so I am not going to follow him. Unanswered or seemingly unanswered prayer. What do you do with it? My experience is different from that. I've had many prayers that God didn't seem to answer. And yet, I, as I look over my life, that song that we just sung is true. God has been good, and God has been faithful. Even in those dark times where I could not see him at work. I've been, lived long enough to see where my perspective on prayer has been flawed. And sometimes I've missed some important stuff when it comes to prayer. So this morning, I want to talk to you about why God doesn't seem to answer prayer. Last week, we we looked at why pray, and it uh, reinforces our connection with God to grow our faith. Prayer changes us. It keeps us from falling into temptation. Prayer allows us to actively participate in the kingdom of God. But today, I want to take nine to talk about nine reasons why God doesn't seem to answer prayer. Uh, the manuscript is on the, on the website, so if you um, want to get those nine reasons again, you can, you can go there. But before we go there, let's pray. Lord, I know that there's people here whose faith was shaken because... Well, you didn't seem to answer prayer. I know there's people who are watching online where they're wondering if you even hear prayer. So Lord, I ask that as I've talked today that you would show us our own hearts and Lord, that you would help us to trust in your goodness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, Reason number one why God doesn't seem to answer our prayers is this. We don't really pray. Um, James chapter 4 verse 2 says, You do not have because you do not ask God. Pastor Ferdinandes from Mumbai, India said that the greatest tragedy is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. I'm not sure what it is about the Canadian culture, but so often we fail to pray. Maybe, maybe it's our individualism that is reluctant to ask people for favors. We can sometimes transfer that to God. Perhaps it's our worldview where we are steeped in a naturalistic worldview where, uh, that has pushed out the supernatural. Or maybe it's a, a reactionary response to false teaching where God always wants us to be healthy and wealthy and never suffer, that we fail to pray. Whatever the reason, the Bible says we do not have because we do not ask. You say, Pastor, well, I, I kind of prayed for what I wanted. I am intrigued by the, the passage in, in, in Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9 has Jesus coming down off the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. Finds at the bottom of the mountain that uh, the nine disciples are there. There's a crowd gathered around them, and things aren't going well for those nine disciples. Because what's happened is a father has brought his son to Jesus and and said, my son's demon-possessed. He throws himself around, and, and I asked your disciples, and they couldn't cast that demon out. Jesus talks about the littleness of their faith, and then he goes on to cast the demon out. But what he says at the end of that is intriguing to me. When the disciples ask, why why did this happen? He tells them, well, 
this kind comes out only by much prayer. Much prayer. He wasn't suggesting that the nine disciples get together and have a prayer meeting uh, and, and then cast the, uh, cast the demons out. No, that, that's not Jesus when he, he just spoke and they were gone. But Jesus was a man of prayer. And so when the need for prayer came up, he was ready to meet it, meet the challenge. We do not have because we do not ask. Uh, you know, we might take a few moments and offer some arrow prayers to heaven. God help. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes we don't really pray. The rest of the reasons I'm going to give you are good and they are true about why God doesn't seem to answer prayer. But they are irrelevant if we don't get this first one, right? Uh, because if you're not praying, the rest of the reasons don't matter. Um, we need to learn to pray. The disciples said Jesus teaches us to pray. You learn to pray by praying, and we're going to look at in upcoming sermons of, of, uh, of what it means to pray, but let me just say this for now. Prayer is an investment. It is an investment of time. It is an investment of energy. It's an investment of focus. Sometimes prayer, it's work. Um, if prayer is an investment, how rich in prayer are you? Second reason why God doesn't seem to answer prayer is that wrong motives block our prayer. James chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. What causes fights and quarrels among you? He's writing to the church. Don't, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire you, you do not have, and so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you, you quarrel and you fight. You do not have, because you do not ask God. And when you ask God, you do not receive, because... Will you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures? Did you catch that? When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. To understand this verse, you need to first understand God. God is loving, and he's gracious, and he's generous, and God loves to bless his children. He loves to bless you. He wants his children to have good things. But the James passage is talks it about our warped desires. Too often our, our desires come out of envy or covetousness or fear or resentment. We want what other people have, uh, or we want other people to envy what we have. If you don't think that's true, just scroll through Facebook. Um, those warped desires, or those desires where comfort is the primary piece, that we want our life to be comfortable, those wrong motives, um, if they fuel our prayer, our prayers don't get answered. Now, the, the verse is not saying that you can't ask for things that you would enjoy. God, as I said, loves to bless his children. But if we are self-centered and living in competition with others, we will not see the blessing that God wants to give. Which of you parents would love, wouldn't you love to give your kids a car or maybe a house? That'd be pretty cool. Um, but, uh, you know, if you knew that one of the reasons they wanted that new car or that new house is that 
uh, well, they could kind of in their own hearts or out loud, yeah, look what I have to their brothers and sisters. Look what, look what my parents gave me. You wouldn't want that, would you? Um, would you give it to them if, if you knew that that car or that house would lead towards self-centered living and life would become all about them? No. A good parent wouldn't do that. God doesn't seem to answer our prayers because we do not pray, and when, when we pray, we, we ask with wrong motives. But I, I want you to know this. God does want you to give, wants to give you good gifts. He does so with uh, three purposes in mind, and uh, these purposes are actually in order. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. First purpose for God answering prayer is his kingdom. Uh, we talked about that last week. You want to bring the kingdom uh, to bear. Second reason is command them to do good, uh, uh, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. God gives us blessings. He blesses us so that we can share them with others. He wants to see his kingdom come. He wants us to be bless others by our giving. And the third and last and most insignificant reason is found in Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to hope, put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. God wants you to enjoy good things. It's okay to enjoy good things. That's the least reason, but it's not. Uh, enjoying what you have is not opposed to God. Put your hope in God, not in your wealth. Seek the kingdom of God and share with others, and then enjoy what you have. Well, back to reasons why God doesn't seem to answer our prayer. Reason number three, double-minded prayers Prevent, answered prayer, uh, prevent answers to prayer. James again, if anyone lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But catch this, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the, the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded, and unstable in all they do. Note that, that verse 6 or verse 5 points to the character of God. God wants to give generously. The, the Greek behind that is that God is a graciously generous, kind God, and it is in, in his nature to give. That is who he is. James also points out that he's generous to all. You can trust him regardless of your race, gender, your station in life. James also tells us how God gives. He gives generously. Some translations have it translated liberally. God, God is an extravagant giver. James says that when we ask, we, we must believe and not doubt. A person who, who's like that is double-minded. So faith is involved in double-mindedness. But um, there's more than that. Double-minded people do not receive from the Lord. I find it interesting that in the book of James, James tells the church to rejoice in their trials. He acknowledges that God works through suffering. So when James is talking about faith, he's not saying that, you know, if you have enough faith, all your problems are going to disappear. What James is calling for is a faith that trusts that God is good even when life is not. And when you pray trusting that God is good, you will find that God is generous. Let me talk about double-mindedness for a moment. There's this curious passage in, in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 33, that says, They worship the Lord, but they also serve their own gods in accordance with the custom of the nations from which they had been brought. That, that's double-mindedness. Serving God 
and serving other gods simultaneously. Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Trying to serve two masters, double-mindedness. We love God, but we love the world. We, we love our life on our terms, but we got, want God to rescue us when we get into trouble. We want Jesus as our Savior, but we want to be our own Lord. That's double-mindedness. That's trying to serve God and other gods simultaneously. James says, if you're there, you, you shouldn't think you're going to receive anything from the Lord. Reason number four. Prayers contrary to God's will and glory Thwart answered prayer. Here are a couple of verses to start with. This is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Or from Jesus, John chapter 14. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Asking in Jesus' name is not tacking Jesus' name onto the end of the prayer. You know, in G we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not what we means. That is not what it means to ask in Jesus' name. Ask in Jesus' name is kind of like submitting a request to the Father that Jesus would sign his signature to, that Jesus would authorize. That's what it means. And so when we pray in Jesus' name, we're praying in congruence with who Jesus is. What did Jesus do? He says, I'm here, I'm going to bring honor to the Father. That's why I'm here. I'm going to bring glory to the Father. That's why I'm here. And so, when we pray in a way that honors God and glorifies God, that's what it means to pray with, with God's will. That's what it means to pray in Jesus' name. Now, there is an exception to this, prayer contrary to God's will and glory thwart the answered prayer. This is a little strange, but let me run it down for you. Numbers chapter 11, people of uh, God's people were enslaved in Egypt, and they had been delivered from Egypt, but they got tired of manna that God provided for them each day the bread that came day by day, and they would go out and they would harvest the bread and they would eat it. And so, you know, they had manna hot cakes and manna bread and manna rice and manna cupcakes and manna, manna, manna. And they started to complain. Numbers 11, 18. The Lord heard you when you wailed. If only we had meat to eat. We were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat, and you will eat. You will not eat it just for one day, or two days, or five days, or ten days, or twenty days, but for a whole month, until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it. <laughs> because you have rejected the Lord who is among you. The psalmist, reflecting on this story, said, So he gave them what they asked for, but sent a wasting disease among them. Um, yeah, what's up with that? Sometimes God will answer that prayer that you insist on making over and over again. Not because it's his will, but in order to teach you a lesson that his ways are better than your ways. He answers that prayer not because it's best for us in the short term, because he knows it's not. But he knows that answering that prayer will teach you about who he is. And it will be better for you in the long term. He's not out to get you. Not at all. He's just calling you to walk with him. Next reason. 
goes along with that one. Sinful behaviors obstruct answers to prayer. Peter chapter 3, For whoever would love his life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He, he must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the faith of the Lord is against those who do evil. Did you catch that? God is attentive to the prayers of the righteous, but he's not attentive to the prayers of those who do evil. That is not saying that you have to be perfect in order for God to answer your prayer. If that were the case, only Jesus would have had answered prayers and everybody else in Scripture would have uh, not seen their prayers answered. That's not what it's saying. But it is saying that answered prayer and holy living go together. Um... What has always defined the people of God is not perfection. What has defined the people of God is a, a desire to do right. And when we do wrong, we keep short accounts with God. And we confess and repent that we went down the wrong path. And we head back towards God, who's on the right path. We repent when we do wrong. And as I quoted in my prayer a little earlier, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But just know this. Holiness matters to answer prayer. Things like unforgiveness and rebellion or mistreating others in word and deed, that gets in the way of answer prayer. Husbands, Peter says, treat your wife right because if you don't, your prayers won't be answered. That's pretty straightforward. Are you treating your right, wife right? Wives, you get a pass on this one. Um, no, treat your husband right too. That would be a good idea. <laughs> it's a good practice to start prayer by worshiping God for who he is. And it is a good practice to then ask God to examine our hearts and repent of anything that has creeped in that is not like him. Reason number six. Individualism may ob obstruct our prayer. There are a couple of problematic kinds of people when it comes to prayer. There's a kind of person who comes up and to me and says, Pastor, will you pray for me? I'm always happy to pray for people. If you want me to pray for you, that's good. The um, problem is, is that they haven't taken the time to pray for themselves. And so what they really want to have happen is me to do their homework for them, right? That's a problem. The other kind is... Uh, is the kind of person who never asks for prayer for themselves. They forget that we're part of the body of Christ. God has so connected us that if one is hurting, it affects us all. Each one of you is a, is a follower of Christ, um, and who is a follower of Christ is part of the body of Christ. God has made us in such a way that we cannot be self-sufficient, we need each other. We need each other's spiritual gifts. We also need each other's prayers. Catch, catch Paul's words in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. It says this, You must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. May I point out to you that if the Apostle Paul thought that he needed help by having getting people to pray for him, that uh, you might need help as well? Just a suggestion. Now, I, I get it that some prayer requests need to be handled with confidentiality. 
Um, we are not going to put out on our prayer chain, and by the way, we do have a prayer chain. It's either by phone or by email, and if you'd like to be part of that prayer chain in order to pray, uh, then call the office and, and uh, uh, Lisa will hook you up with that. But we're not going to put on our prayer chain so-and-so and so-and-so are having trouble in their marriage. Ah, that, that's not cool. There are some prayer requests that are confidential, and so you only share them with a few people. That's okay, and that's right. There are other prayer requests that aren't so confidential, and you can have the whole body of Christ praying for you. And uh, I'll say this, that people's definition of confidentiality differ widely. Now, please respect them. Um, and, uh, you know, so I'll just, I'll, I will leave that there. But I'll say this, the prayers of God's people matter. Paul needed help. You need help. Do not let individualism get in the way of prayer. Reason number seven. Inaction may frustrate answers to prayer. All the way through Scripture, you have people combining prayer with action. Nehemiah, he was praying. He, he wanted to go back to Jerusalem. He heard about the city that lay in ruin. And he was praying and praying but then he needed to take the action of going and talking to the king, which was scary. He did it anyways, and God did a miracle. Book of Nehemiah. Book of Esther. Bad things were going to happen to the Jewish people. Esther was a wife of the king, but in that time, that king had many wives, and the wife wasn't allowed to approach the king unless she was called for and yet Esther decided, I need to approach the king on behalf of my people. So she prayed and prayed, and then she took action. You know, someone once said that prayer without a action is as defective as action without prayer. Something to that. When you're praying for something, part of what you should be asking God for, is there anything you want me to do here? Reason number eight, better answers mask answers to prayer. Sometimes God is so generous that he gives us stuff in answer to our prayer, and we reject it or we don't see it because he's given us much more than we could ask or imagine. Suppose I had a teenager who asked for a bicycle and I gave them a car. Did I ask, did I... Uh, fulfill the request exactly? No. Sometimes God does that. Now suppose you ask God for a car, but God provides someone else to give you a ride to work and take you to the grocery store. Has God answered your prayer? Not in the way that you wanted. You wanted the car. But if you were to take the money you saved in insurance and gas and maintenance, cars are a money bit. Um, and uh, you put that into a car. It wouldn't be long until you could afford a car. And in the process, God has taught you something. Sometimes God answers prayer in a way that masks what we prayed for. Paul asked for relief from his thorn in the flesh. God gave him grace that was sufficient. Jesus' disciples said, Lord, save us from our oppressors. And Jesus said, I'll do one better. I will save you from yourselves. God often skips over short-sighted answers to prayer with a better answer. But sometimes those answers mask that. Reason number nine. Divine timing delays answers to prayer. And that, my friends, is next week's sermon. So uh, you'll have to catch, come back and, and catch that one. There are probably a number of other reasons why prayers go unanswered. But I believe that one of the ways that the devil slanders the name of God is, is that his, uh, to his people is that they think that God is not good because he has not answered prayer. I, 
I want you to, to know that God is good. Sometimes there are reasons that our prayers go unanswered. If you are, have been praying about something for a long time, it is good and right to ask God if there's anything hindering your prayers. He may have even shown you something while I've been speaking. Press into that. Pray about that. Act on that. Now, I do realize that there are some times when we will not know the reason for unanswered prayer until we get to heaven. And sometimes I think that that mystery, it comforts some, and people use it as an excuse to not pray for others. Would you pray, God, teach me how to pray? Here's what I know. God is good. God is generous. And he loves, he really loves his people. And he wants to bless you. So often we fail to believe that. Would you take a look at, at the reasons and ask God, is there, is there something that is getting in the way of, of my prayers? We don't really pray. Wrong motives block our prayers. Double mind is a, prevents us, prevents answers to prayer. Prayer contrary to God's will and glory thwart our answers to prayer. Sinful behavior obstructs answers to prayer. Individualism may obstruct answers to prayer. Inaction may frustrate answers to prayer. Better answers mass answers to prayer. Divine timing delays answers to prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we have raced through your word in regards to unanswered prayer. Lord, each one of us come from a different place. For the people who have had their faith shaken because you haven't come through in the way that they've asked, God, would you restore faith in your goodness? For people, as I've been speaking, who have seen something of their own heart in the reasons of unanswered prayer, I'm asking, Lord, that you would help them to repent and move away from that and move towards you. Thank you for your promises, says that when we draw near to you, you draw near to us. Lord, altogether, though, we would say we do not have because we do not ask, so we te ask, Lord, teach us to pray. Amen. I'm going to ask that you stand with us as we sing our closing song, Good, Good Father.
thank you so much for who you are. I pray that great faith in your goodness would arise within us, that you would, we would trust you to be good. I ask, Lord, as we go about this week, that you would give us wisdom and grace and love uh, to meet all the situations we encounter. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You, can, you are dismissed. Uh, thank you for joining us online. Please take some time and socially distance, but talk to the people around you. You don't have to run out. You can, you can talk to them. And please exit by the back door if you are physically able.